It was all about me. What about Samson? At least leave him on the project murders, I said to the chief of detectives. You got any complaints, take them up with the mayor. You're both working on this kidnapping. That's all I have to say to you at this time. Pittman turned his back on us and walked away. We were on the Dunn Goldberg kidnapping case, like it or not. We didn't like it. Maybe we should just go back to the Sanders house, I said to Samson. Nobody miss us here, he agreed. Chapter 7 A gleaming black BMW K1 motorcycle squeezed between the low fieldstone gates of the Washington Day School. The driver was ID'd, then the bike sped down a long, narrow road toward a gray cluster of school buildings. It was eleven o'clock. The BMW K1 streaked to sixty in the few seconds it took to get to the administration building. The motorcycle then braked easily and smoothly, barely throwing gravel. The rider slid it in behind a pearl-gray Mercedes stretch limousine with diplomats' plates DP-101. Still seated on the bike... Jessie Flanagan pulled off a black helmet to reveal longish blonde hair. She looked to be in her late twenties. Actually, she'd turned thirty-two that summer. Life was threatening to pass her right by. She was a relic now. Ancient history, she believed. She had come straight to the school from her late cottage, not to mention her first vacation in twenty-nine months. That latter fact helped to explain her style of dress that morning. The leather bike jacket, the faded black jeans with leg warmers, thick leather belt, the red and black checkered lumberman's shirt, and the worn engineering boots. Two D.C. policemen rushed up on either side of her. It's okay, officers, she said. Here's my I.D. After eyeing the identification, they backed away quickly and became solicitous. You can go right in, one of them said. There's a side door just around those high hedges, Miss Flanagan. Jesse Flanagan managed a friendly smile for the two harried-looking policemen. I don't exactly look the part today, I know. I was on my vacation. I raced the bike. I raced it here. Jessie Flanagan took the shortcut across a pristine lawn that was lightly coated with frost. She disappeared inside the school's administration building. Neither of the D.C. policemen took his eyes off her until she was gone. Her blonde hair blew like streamers in the stiff winter wind. She was definitely stunning to look at, even in dirty jeans and work boots. And she had a very powerful job. They both knew that from her ID. She was a player. As she made her way through the front lobby, someone grabbed at her. Someone caught a piece of Jessie Flanagan, which was typical of her life in D.C. Victor Schmidt had hooked onto her arm. Once upon a time, and this was difficult for Jessie to imagine now, Victor had been her partner. Her first, in fact. Now he was assigned to one of the students at the day school. Victor was short and balding. A stylish GQ sort of dresser, confident for no particularly good reason. He'd always struck her as misplaced in the Secret Service, maybe better suited for lower rungs of the diplomatic corps. Jesse, how's it going? He half whispered, half spoke. He never seemed to go all the way on anything, she remembered. That had always bugged her. Jesse Flanagan blew up. Later she realized she had really been on edge when Schmidt stopped her. Not that she needed an excuse for the flare up. Not that morning. Not under the circumstances. Vic, do you know that two children have been taken from this school, maybe kidnapped, she snapped? One is the Secretary of Treasury's son, the other is Catherine Rose's little girl, the actress Catherine Rose Dunn. How do you think I'm doing? I'm a little sick to my stomach. I'm angry. I'm also petrified. I just meant hello. Hello, Jesse. I know what the hell has happened here. But Jessie Flanagan had already walked away, at least partly to keep from saying anything else to Victor. She did feel nervous, and ill, and mostly wired as hell. She wasn't so much looking for familiar faces in the crowded school lobby as the right faces. There were two of them now. Charlie Chakley and Mike Devine, her agents. The two men she had assigned to young Michael Goldberg and also Maggie Rose Dunn, since they traveled back and forth to school together. How could this happen? Her voice was loud. She didn't care that the talk nearby had stopped and people were staring. A black hole was cut into the noise and chaos of the school lobby. Then she lowered her voice to a whisper as she questioned the agents about what had happened so far. She listened quietly as she let them explain. Apparently, she didn't like what they had to say. Get the hell out of here, she exploded a second time. Get out right now, out of my sight. 
There was nothing we could have done, Charlie Chakley tried to protest. What could we have done? Jesus Christ! Then he and Devine skulked away. Those who knew Jesse Flanagan might have understood her emotional reaction. Two children were missing. It had happened on her watch. She was an immediate supervisor of the Secret Service agents who guarded just about everyone other than the President, key cabinet members and their families, about half-dozen senators, including Ted Kennedy. She reported to the Secretary of the Treasury himself. She had worked unbelievably hard to get all that trust and responsibility, and she was responsible. Hundred-hour weeks. No vacation year after year. No life to speak of. She could hear the upcoming scuttlebutt before it happened. Two of her agents had royally screwed up. There would be an investigation, an old-fashioned witch hunt. Jesse Flanagan was on the hot seat. Since she was the first woman ever to hold her job, the fall, if it came, would be steep and painful and very public. She finally spotted the one person she'd been looking for in the crowd and hoping not to find. Secretary of the Treasury Gerald Goldberg had already arrived at his son's school. Standing with the secretary... Lamea Carl Monroe, an FBI special agent she knew named Roger Graham, and two black men she didn't recognize right off. Both of the blacks were tall, one of them extremely so, huge. Jesse Flanagan took a deep breath and then walked quickly over to Secretary Goldberg and the others. I'm very sorry, Gerald, she said in a whisper as she arrived. I'm sure the children will be found. A teacher was all Gerald Goldberg could manage. He shook his head of close-cropped white curls. His eyes were wet and shiny. A teacher of children. Little babies. How could this happen? He was clearly heartbroken. The secretary looked ten years older than his actual age, which was forty-nine. His face was as white as the school's stucco walls. Before coming to Washington, Gerald Goldberg had been at Salomon Brothers on Wall Street. He'd made twenty or thirty million in the prosperous, thoroughly crazy 1980s. He was bright, world-wise, and tested on his wisdom. He was as pragmatic as they came. On this day, though, he was just the father of a kidnapped little boy, and he looked extremely fragile. Chapter 8 I was talking to Roger Graham from the FBI when the Secret Service supervisor, Jesse Flanagan, joined our group. She said what she could to comfort Secretary Goldberg. Then the talk quickly turned back to the apparent kidnapping and the next steps to be taken. Are we a hundred percent sure it was this math teacher who took the children? Graham asked the group. He and I had worked closely together before. Graham was extremely smart and had been a star in the Bureau for years. He'd co-written a book about busting up organized crime in New Jersey. It had been made into a hit movie. We respected and liked each other which is rare between the Bureau and local police. When my wife had been killed in Washington, Roger had gone out of his way to involve the Bureau in the investigation. He'd given me more help than my own department. I decided to try to answer Roger Graham's question. I'd calmed down enough to talk by then, and I told them what Samson and I had picked up so far. They definitely left the school grounds together, I said. A porter saw them. The math teacher, a Mr. Saniji, went to Ms. Kim's class. He lied to her, said there was a telephone threat, and that he was supposed to take the kids to the headmaster's office to be driven home. Said the Secret Service hadn't specified whether the threat involved the boy or girl. He just kept on going with them. The kids trusted him enough to go along. How could a potential kidnapper possibly get on the teaching staff of this kind of school? The special agent asked. A pair of sunglasses peeked from the breast pocket of his suit. Winter shades. Harrison Ford had played him in the movie made from his book. It wasn't bad casting, really. Samson called Graham Big Screen. That we don't know yet, I told Graham. We will soon. Samson and I were finally introduced to Secretary Goldberg by Maya Monroe. Monroe did a little bit on how we were one of D.C.'s most decorated detective teams and so on and so forth. Then the mayor ushered the secretary inside the headmaster's office. Special Agent Graham trailed along. He rolled his eyes at Samson and me. He wanted us to know it wasn't his show. Jesse Flanagan stayed behind. I've heard about you, Detective Cross. Now that I think of it, you're the psychologist. 
There was an article in the Washington Post. She smiled nicely. A demi-smile. I didn't smile back. You know newspaper articles, I told her. Usually a pack of half-truths. In that case, definitely some tall tales. I'm not so sure about that, she said. Nice to meet you, anyway. Then she walked into the office behind Secretary Goldberg, the mayor, and the star FBI agent. Nobody invited me, the psychologist detective of magazine fame. Nobody invited Samson. Monroe did poke his head out. Stick around, you two. Don't make any waves. Don't get pissy, either. We need you here. I need to talk with you, Alex. Stay put. Don't get pissy. Samson and I tried to be good cops. We stood around outside the headmaster's office for another ten minutes. Finally, we left our posts. We were feeling pissy. I kept seeing the face of little Mustaf Sanders. Who was going to go and find his killer? No one. Mustaf had already been forgotten. I knew that would never happen with the two private school children. A little later that morning, Samson and I were lying across the natural pine floor of the day school playroom with a few of the children. We were there with Louisa, Jonathan, Stuart, Mary Berry, and her big sister Bridget. No one had been able to pick these kids up yet, and they were frightened. Some of the children at the school had wet their pants, and there was one case of severe vomiting. There was the possibility of crisis trauma, a condition I had some experience treating. Also down on the polished wood floor with us was the teacher, Vivian Kim. We'd wanted to talk to her about Suniji's visit to her class, and Suniji in general. We're new kids in your school, Samson joked with the children. He had actually taken his sunglasses off, though I wasn't sure if he had to. Kids usually take to Samson. He fits into their friendly monster grouping. No, you're not, said Mary Berry. Samson had gotten her to smile already. A good sign. That's right. We're really policemen, I told the kids. We're here to make sure everybody's okay now. I mean, phew, what a morning. Miss Kim smiled at me from across the floor. She knew I was trying to give the kids some reassurance. The police were there, and it was safe again. No one could hurt them now. Order had been restored. Are you a good policeman? Jonathan asked me. He seemed very serious and earnest for such a small boy. Yes, I am. So is my partner here, Detective Sampson. You're big. You're awfully big, said Louisa. Big, big, big as my house. So we can protect everybody better, Sampson said to the little girl. Sampson had caught on fast. Do you have any kids? Bridget asked me. She'd carefully observed us both before speaking. She was wonderfully bright-eyed, and I liked her already. I have two children, I said, a boy and a girl. And what are their names? asked Bridget. She had neatly reversed our roles. Janelle and Damon, I told her. Janelle's four and Damon six. What's your wife's name? asked Stuart. I don't have a wife, I told him. My, 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 Mr. Rogers, Samson said under his breath. Are you divorced? Mary Berry asked me. Is that the deal? Miss Kim laughed out loud. What a question to ask our nice friend, Mary. Are they going to hurt Maggie Rose and Michael Goldberg? Jonathan the Serious wanted to know. It was a good, fair question. It deserved an answer. I hope they won't, Jonathan. I will tell you one thing. Nobody will hurt you. Detective Sampson and I are here just to make sure. We're tough, in case you couldn't tell, Sampson grinned. Grrr. Nobody will ever hurt these kids. Grrr. Louisa started to cry a few minutes later. She was a cute kid. I wanted to hug her, but I couldn't. What's the matter, Louisa? Miss Kim asked. Your mom or your dad will be here soon. No, they won't. The little girl shook her head. They won't come. They never pick me up at school. Someone will come, I said in a quiet voice. And tomorrow, everything will be fine again. The door to the playroom slowly opened. 
I looked away from the children.